Hi folks, welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show. This is Tony coming to you from New Zealand and with me on the show today I have Alex Newman and Alex has been a uh, guest rather frequently in recent times on the A Minute to Midnight show and a very popular one and I always enjoy our discussions and I'm sure there will be some very interesting things coming out again today. So welcome Alex. Thank you so much. Great to be here Tony. And um I guess we just briefly talked off air about a few things that we can discuss uh, and I, I'll let you open it to however you want to go in whatever direction. So, Sure. Well, one of the big things that I just participated in uh, a few days ago, uh, we had a big event in Virginia Beach, Virginia, uh, in honor of the very first landing, the first English settlers who arrived here. Uh, it's a fascinating history, and it's a history that unfortunately is is almost completely unknown to America. Even people who live right where it happened know almost nothing about this. But to kind of uh, give a, a very abbreviated version of the history, um, the king had given a charter allowing uh, some settlers to come over here and, and create a colony in uh, Virginia. And the very first thing they did when they arrived, they got here on uh, April 26th of 1607. The very first thing they did when they got here was they they prayed, they uh, fasted, and they put up a big giant cross. They had a, a spare mast on one of their ships. They put a cross beam on it, and they, they went to the top of this hill, and they put up a big cross. And um, they uh, under the leadership of uh, Reverend Robert Hunt, who was the, the chaplain that went with this crew, um, they prayed. To, and we have the whole prayer, so we know exactly what they prayed. And uh, you know, they started off by thanking God and thank you for the safe journey. And they dedicated this new land to Christ. And they asked God's blessing. They asked that uh, he would use them and their efforts to evangelize the people on these shores, uh, who, of course, were completely unfamiliar with the gospel, who, who lived completely without the light of the gospel. Uh, and also that God would use this new land to evangelize the world, this new land and Britain, of course. They, they said, you know, use uh, England and this new land to take the gospel to the entire world, to take the kingdom of God to the entire world is actually what they said. And um, that was a very important part of our history. In fact, that was the beginning of our history in terms of what eventually became the United States of America. Yet they did a poll. Not more than one in a hundred Americans knows anything about this. Uh, there's still a cross there. The original one came down in the 1800s. It you know, rotted away after all those years, but they replaced it with a granite one. And, um, you know, the, the, the settlers, they viewed it as a covenant. They were making a covenant with God. Uh, they said, you know, we're going to raise up godly generations after us, and and we're going to dedicate ourselves to spreading the gospel to every corner of the earth. Uh, and they did that, and God uh, honored that. God blessed that. Uh, of course, America sent more missionaries to more parts of the world than any other nation in all of human history. And, and even today, as godless as our nation has become, we continue to send missionaries all over the world. So it's a, it's a wonderful history. Uh, you know, one of the things that we tried to do is just you know, rededicate this nation to God, uh, ask, you know, the big part of the event was repentance, right? A, a huge segment of the uh, event was dedicated to really corporate and individual repentance for, uh, you know, the abortion, for for the godlessness, for for trusting our children to a, a godless education system, for, for not honoring uh, what we uh, are called to do, according to the word of God. But um, it was really a, a special time, uh, an important time. I really think it was historic. They, they promised they're going to be doing this uh, every year going forward. And, uh, you know, and I'm sure New Zealand has similar things in your history. But the history, the early history of America is so fascinating. You know, a lot of people know about the pilgrims. Uh, but I, I've seen how they teach this in the schools, Tony, and it, it makes you want to cry. You know, the pilgrims. Uh, who, who landed, of course, in 1621 in what is today Massachusetts, before they got off the ship, they signed the Mayflower Compact. This was really the first governing document for uh, a community in the United States. And they actually say in this document that uh, we're, we're doing this for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. And what, yet when you read this in a, in a textbook, for example, in public school, they say, uh, you know, we've undertaken a journey, dot, 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 to plant a colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Well, you missed out what was in the dot, dot, dot. What was in the dot, dot, dot? Well, it was for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith. So they're they're trying to eradicate the Christian history of our nation, uh, really Christian history, period. And, uh, you know, I think it's very deliberate. It's very strategic. Uh, and, and this was the norm throughout America, right? When the, when the New England colonies formed a confederation in 1643, they, their charter, their Articles of Confederation said, uh, whereas we all came into these parts to honor God and to live out our lives in the purity of the gospel in peace, uh, they said they all came here for that purpose. And so that's the real history of America. And yet your average young people today have never heard of this. I, I would say not one in a thousand young Americans know 
knows anything about this. Uh, and in my opinion, that's a crime, Tony. Yes, well, it wasn't that long until the Masons started infiltrating America after that, you know, a lot of the founding fathers and things. So I suppose the move towards, you know, anything but true Christianity probably started fairly early on. But it's interesting to hear that that's what it was like in the 1600s. Hmm. Very interesting. Yep. Yeah, there, there's a lot of interesting history there. You know, uh, George Washington, who himself was a Mason, although there are reports that he, for the last few decades of his life, he never stepped in a Masonic lodge. But he was asked uh, by a friend of his, a reverend, who gave him a copy of a book that's so significant. I actually have several copies. I sometimes give them out to people. It's called Proofs of a Conspiracy. Um, one of the most interesting books I've ever read. It's very difficult to read because it's kind of written in older English. The you know grammatical structure is a little bit different. But this was actually written by a high-level Scottish Mason. And what he says, he had, he had traveled through the, uh, through the continent, through the mainland, and what he found was that there was this um, group of conspirators that he, he described as trying to hijack Freemasonry. And he said in many cases they had been successful. He said actually in France they, uh, they were the ones responsible for the French Revolution. Uh, and he, he actually lays out this case that this insidi- you know, what we know, to know today as the Illuminati, founded by Adam Weiss yeah. in 1776. And so George Washington was asked about this in a letter uh, – from a friend who gave him a copy of this book, Proofs of a Conspiracy. Do you, do you think Illuminati and, and Jacobinism has infected the United States through masonry? And George Washington gives a, a really interesting response. He says, you know, I have no doubt that these doctrines are, are coming into the United States. And, you know, they it's not as um, powerful maybe as it is in Europe. But even George Washington, himself a Mason, recognized that there was this insidious force that was trying to uh, weaponize Freemasonry. Uh, as really a battering ram against Christian civilization. And, and if you read this book, Proofs of a Conspiracy, you'll see that the fruit of this conspiracy is what we saw in the French Revolution. Mass murder, uh, a hatred of Christianity that is so passionate. I mean, the French revolutionaries, in addition to chopping off the heads of tens of thousands of innocent people, uh, they actually hated God so much, they said we couldn't even have a seven-day week anymore because, of course, God you know, created the world and six days rested on the seventh. They said, no, we're going to have a 10-day week because you know, we got to get rid of every vestige of Christian culture, of Christian civilization. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's been this ongoing war between the truth and the lie. Um, and, you know, Americans and, and New Zealanders and people around the world need to understand what we're living through now is not new. This is a battle that's been going on for a long time. Yes, it's been hidden from your history textbooks, but uh, right beneath the surface, there are hidden powers that are waging war on God. There are wa- that are waging war on God's people that are waging war on the word of God. Um, and you know, if you go back far enough, you go to, for example, the book of Psalms um, during the time of King David in Psalm 2, you have this reference to the kings of the earth and the rulers conspiring together against the Lord and his anointed one. Uh, some, some translations say uh, taking counsel together against the Lord and his anointed one. So you've always had for, for human history this these very powerful people, uh, in, I, I would say in league with the powers and principalities described in, for example, Ephesians chapter 6, trying to wage war on God, trying to overthrow God, which is, of course was you know the original proud Lucifer wanted to overthrow God. Uh, And, you know, I don't believe that they will ever be successful despite their delusions. God is going to remain sovereign. God is going to remain on the throne. And all of the kings and the rulers and the powers and principalities combined are like nothing compared to God. But this is part of our history and our, our young people should know it. They should know the history of our civilization, of our culture, of the church, right? Church history is so important and yet it's it's so rarely taught. Um, and this is all critical stuff to understand, you know, who are we now? What, what, what do we make of this time and this place that we find ourselves in? You really can't make sense of it unless you know at least some of these basics. Well, it, it's interesting you mentioned Adam Weishaupt and the Illuminati and you know, we've got so much of a move towards Marxism, communism, socialism in the world today, and really Karl Marx parroted pretty much Adam Weishaupt's stuff. He just put it into his communist manifesto, but really it was the same things, the same seven-part plan, seven-step plan to, um, you know, change the world, bring the new world order, whatever you want to call it, that Adam Weishaupt laid out, and... I, th- I think you, know, you you see this going forward. Obviously, you've had communist countries in China and the Soviet Union and so on. But when you look at the United Nations and what they are seemingly trying to achieve, and it's very much that socialist mindset 
that goes probably all the way back to starting in 1776, if not before. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%, Tony. And I, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I, I think that's so important for people to understand. People think Karl Marx just showed up on the scene and just came up with these ideas. Absolute baloney. I mean, Karl Marx and, and Frederick Engels, they were hired by the League of the Just, this kind of secretive society of very wealthy people and aristocrats, incidentally, uh, to come up with this claptrap. Uh, and really, you know, Adam Weishaupt and later the Communist Manifesto, these principles, when you clear away the fancy titles and the supposed authors, um, it's really just an inversion of biblical principles, right? God created the family, and so Adam Weishaupt wanted to disband the family and have women held in common. Exactly the same thing that Karl Marx would advocate, um, you know, hundred years less than a hundred years later. Um, uh, God divided the world up into nations, right? Uh, go read uh, Deuteronomy chapter thirty-two. Go read uh, Acts chapter seventeen, right? God is the one who ordained that there should be nations. He divided people up into nations. You can read that whole story, uh, Genesis. Genesis chapter 11. They came together in this one world system. They wanted to build this crazy tower. God said, nope, I told you already, spread out across the whole face of the earth. So that's what he did. He divided us up into nations. Uh, God, of course, ordained private property. When he said, thou shalt not steal, that's about as clear of a mandate for the respect of private property rights as one could ever find anywhere. Thou shalt not steal. And so uh, Adam Weishaupt and then later uh, Karl Marx said, no, we got to get rid of private property. So who would want to get rid of property? Who would want to get rid of nations? Who would want to get rid of the family and uh, and ultimately get rid of civil government? Right. Of course, God also ordained civil government as a restraint on sin. Who would want to do that? Well, of course, Satan would want to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is just satanic. This is just straight from the pit of hell. And, and that's not to say that your average communist revolutionary understands this. Now, that's not to say that your average uh, useful idiot of the conspirators understands this. But ultimately, they are working toward satanic diabolical principles that come from the pit of hell. Uh, they're going to lose. There's there's no doubt about it. Their agenda will fail, but uh, but that's what they're doing. And that's really the simplest way to put it. And I believe that's the only way to truly understand it, Tony. That's, that's very good. Very good points. So when, when we're watching the United Nations at work and, and everything that's being put into place, and it seems to me that they're moving more and more to a power grab for a global government type power grab, probably with the UN as the at least starting point for it in so many different areas. You've got the pandemic treaty thing, you've got um, the climate change agenda or whatever, you know, and they want control and um, virtually usurping nation states' authority and putting it under the global auspices of the UN. Yeah, and, and actually, there's been a major development on this front. I just broke the story uh, recently, uh, the front page story on the in the Epic Times. Um, critical story. I'm amazed that nobody had been talking about this yet. But the Secretary General of the UN, who you know, speaking of communists and socialists, he was the leader of the Socialist International before taking over the UN. It's the world's largest alliance of communist and socialist political parties. Uh, they've got many of their members have the blood of millions of innocent people on their hands. It's, it's a monstrous group. Uh, and so the secretary general has proposed in this policy brief, uh, they call it our common agenda, which, you know, nobody asked me. I'm pretty sure they didn't ask you, Tony. Uh, certainly not my agenda. Certainly not our common agenda no. because I reject this. But um, the, he's proposing and there's one it's one of several proposals as part of this common agenda. But this one that I focused in on uh, would make the U.N., in the words of the, the proposal, the primary decision making authority in the event of a global emergency or a global crisis. It would put into place what the text describes as protocols to be activated whenever the secretary general decrees that there is some sort of global emergency. Now, as you read this document, you find out it doesn't actually have to be global uh, and it doesn't actually have to be an emergency. <laughs> okay, it's interesting. Uh, they list different things like climate change, um, environmental degradation, economic crisis, an interruption in the flow of goods or people or capital. Uh, they also list for good measure a black swan event, which, you know, we don't know what it is, but we might need to invoke total U.N. authority. Uh, they, they give a, a number of different examples of cyber attack, things like this. Um, and they make very clear then that when the secretary general were to invoke this, if it's approved uh, later this year, all of the, the national governments of the world, the private sector, the businesses, the non-governmental organizations, the experts, everybody would come together. And it says the primary decision making authority would be with the United Nations and with its subsidiary agencies, the World Health Organization, the U.N. Environmental Program, things like this. So uh, this would 
functionally make the secretary general into a global dictator who would oversee then our own national governments, our regional governments like the European Union, our companies. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's hard to overstate the significance of this. Um, I did reach out to the Biden administration. I reached out to the State Department and asked them for their thoughts. And they didn't give me a clear answer one way or the other, but they basically said we support this without saying we support it. They said we believe uh, the UN is the best vehicle for you know global peace and security and these kinds of things. And so rah, rah. Um, I reached out also to uh, the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee in our House of Representatives. He happens to be a Republican, uh, Chairman Mike McCall, uh, and he expressed some concern. I, I don't know that he knew about this. I get the sense that he didn't. But um, I, I guess after his staff kind of looked over what was going on here and briefed him, uh, he expressed concerns that this may be you know, a Biden method to sneak through the climate agenda, um, that it would be a threat to our sovereignty, that it would be a threat to our taxpayer dollars. So I'm glad that there's at least some tepid uh, response from House Republicans in our House of Representatives. They ultimately control the purse strings. Um, you also mentioned the World Health Organization. As, as you know, they're working right now on the international pandemic. It was the treaty. Now it's the accord because if it's a treaty, our U.S. Senate's going to have to ratify it. And of course, they're not going to. Uh, and then at the same time, they're doing these amendments to the international health regulations, which would just bring all this stuff in through the back door. So we're watching right now, Tony, an incredible power grab by the United Nations. And uh, we need to be aware because, uh, you know, what they're talking about here is really full dictatorial control over every element of our lives under the guise of protecting us from crises, many of which, incidentally, they created themselves. And you couple that with central bank digital currencies and digital IDs, and that gives them the means to be able to do that. Because at the moment, when you've got people existing without necessarily having a digital ID and using cash and having bank accounts and, you know, and bartering and whatever, that makes it harder for them to control. But as soon as they put central bank digital currencies that are programmable into place, uh, that changes the ball game altogether. And um, there's moves towards that global central bank digital currencies, um, which should be a big concern to all of us. It should be. And, you know, thankfully here in the United States, it is. Um, here in Florida, we just passed a law banning CBDCs, and I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm very pleased with our state legislators and also our governor, Ron DeSantis, who, who made this a priority. Um, you know, Florida's one state, but we're a big state. We're a powerful state. We're now the third largest state in the union. And so that's encouraging. Uh, I, I've been working with legislators all across the country who are now introducing or have introduced similar bills. Uh, I think North Carolina just passed one recently. So there is a lot of active resistance here in the United States to this agenda. Um, and, you know, part of it is the globalists are trying to get our states to change their legislation to actually facilitate this transition. Um, in the United States, you know, every state kind of controls its own laws on most things. Uh, and so they've created a, what they call a uniform law commission, where they want to try to kind of harmonize the, the business and financial laws between the various states. And uh, this is not technically a government organization, although the states send representatives. And so the Uniform Law Commission is now recommending to all the states that they adopt these updates to the Uniform Commercial Code where um, they would basically be allowed to bring in central bank digital currencies. Uh, and thankfully, a lot of our states have said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, it started with uh, South Dakota, uh, the governor there, Governor Christy Nome. Um, vetoed the legislation that would have brought in those changes in South Dakota's line. She put out a brilliant letter. She said, look, we're not going to be approving CBDCs before we even know what they look like. Um, you know, this is a dangerous uh, power grab by the federal government, and we're not going to facilitate this. Uh, so I'm encouraged by the resistance that we're seeing at the state level. Uh, similar things happening with the digital ID. You know, we have some states here in the United States that are moving now forward with uh, pilot programs for digital IDs. In fact, the U.S. Senate just passed a very significant bill advancing digital IDs. But at the same time, we're having a lot of opposition at the state level. And, uh, you know, thankfully, because of our federalist system, our states do have a lot of sway. You know, we don't have any like national ID system in the United States. Our, our state governments issue our driver's licenses and things like this. So, um, so they're, they're running into a lot of problems here in the United States, and I'm encouraged by that. But you're right about the, the global push for CBDCs and, and uh, digital IDs. It's a critical part of Klaus Schwab's fourth industrial revolution. He, you know, he's the front man for this agenda. He's not obviously the mastermind. Yeah. But um, he says the end of it is the fusion of our digital and our biological identity. So that's where they're, they're trying to move us here with this kind of mark where you're not going to be able to buy or sell without um, you know, accepting this mark. You won't be able to participate in the economy. That's what they want. Um, but you know, it's good. A lot of Americans are waking up. I'm, I'm encouraged by this. And um, you know, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, and I know there's opposition in other parts of the world as well. It's not just uh, here in the United States, but uh, good things happening. And of course, terribly concerning things happening. Well, I can see the Fed Now system 
being uh, launched pretty soon. And then you've got these banking crises happening, and I can see them getting worse and escalating. To me, it looks like their goal will be to have mass panic, and so everyone's going to go, we need this system, and yep. and gladly take it on. At the moment, you know, people are resisting it and going, no, we don't want that. But if they create big enough crisis, that may change. And I suspect that we may see some of that um, a little later this year. Interesting, though, I see um, Texas, uh, some committee uh, has launched a, a bill for wanting to make gold and silver legal currency and um, and to circumvent the whole C- CBDC's thing. But again, I don't know how far that'll go. Yeah, well, Texas is interesting. They actually have already... Uh, created a Texas bullion depository where a citizen can take uh, their gold to this depository. And the legislation they're working on right now, um, and I'm a little bit involved in this, I think it's a phenomenal idea. Uh, They're trying to facilitate commerce in this because, uh, you know, I've been telling lawmakers in my discussions with them, like, think of the America of America as like the Titanic, right? And and the Titanic's already got a big gash in the side. You mentioned the banking crises that I think they're going to accelerate. Um, You know, you don't want to be building lifeboats while the ship is in the final phases of sinking, right? It's better to work on these lifeboats now. Um, And so I I think you're exactly right about the banking crises. You know, they can cause a run on the banks and then say, whoops, turns out the banks don't actually have your money. But don't worry, we're going to replace your dollars with digital dollars and you're not even going to notice the difference. It's going to be practically the same thing, except you're going to have to spend it with your smartphone or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, A lot of people will go along with that. But, um, you know, I've been talking to legislators all across the country on this issue of, you know, our Constitution in Article one, Section 10 states very, very clearly no state shall make anything other than gold and silver a tender in payment of debts. Uh, The Constitution says states must make nothing but gold and silver legal tender. And so a lot of our states have already done the right thing and they have re-legalized gold and silver as legal tender. That's a good first step. This has been going on for over a decade now. Utah, Alabama, Oklahoma, a lot of states are moving in this direction. And that's important for a few reasons, Tony. Uh, One is that you know, when gold and silver are treated as an asset, as like an investment, there's capital gains taxes associated with that. So just, you know, hypothetically speaking, let's say I buy an ounce of gold for $2,000. Uh, the the criminals running the Federal Reserve devalue the dollar by, you know, half. Now suddenly my, my gold ounce is worth $4,000. If that gold ounce is treated as an investment, then I'm going to have to pay capital gains, right? My, my asset went from $2,000 to $4,000. The government will say that's a 100% capital gains hand over the money, right? And so I can't use that in commerce. That's mm-hmm. ridiculous. The government's going to be stealing a big part of that. Uh, and so by coming in and saying this is legal tender, it's no longer, it's not like a stock or a house or a commercial property where you're going to have to pay tax on the capital gains. So this is important. And, uh, you know, if Texas gets this right. Um, they're, they're, they're looking at several different systems. Uh, I know one of the things they're talking about is a digital card, which, you know, I wish they would come up with maybe a less high tech version of it, maybe like a checkbook or something, but they're looking for a way for you to be able to take the gold that you have on, on deposit at the Texas Bullion Depository and go spend that in a business in Texas at a grocery store or a mechanic. Um, And this is really, really good, especially as the crises get more intense. It'll be very, very helpful for the people of Texas and any other state that chooses to do this, to have an alternative means of conducting commerce. Um, and in fact, it may actually save your state from total collapse, like what we saw in the Great Depression when the Federal Reserve sucked all the money out of the system. Uh, we're watching that happen right now. We know where it leads to, uh, but states can take very, very important steps. You know, North Dakota is another interesting state. It's the only state in our union that has a state bank. And, uh, you know, normally uh, on, I'm just radically opposed to government involvement in the economy like that. I don't think the government ought to own a bank. But when you live under a totally fraudulent monetary system and a totally fraudulent banking system where the banks use uh, fractional reserve banking to magically expand the currency and basically impose usury on the population, having a state bank actually enables that state to be able to continue to finance the things that that state would need without bankrupting the population. So there's a lot of options that the states can explore, that the states are exploring, that I think can protect at least some of us from the horrors that these totalitarians have planned. Well, the, the banks, you know, we've got the small ones going under and the last one, or no, even weren't so small. They're bigger than the banks that failed in 2008. But like J, the likes of JP Morgan becoming more powerful uh, through acquiring these, and I can see that, that, that move to be to move or remove the smaller banks and it'll be the conglomerates like that 
Uh, and isn't that pretty much what happened to the Great Depression as well? They became the big banks became more powerful. Yeah, it's exactly what's happening here, Tony. That's exactly what's happened here. And actually, some members of Congress have asked uh, uh, the people over at the U.S. Treasury Department about this. Well, we're not really doing that on purpose. But what they want to do is they want uh, Americans to pull their money from the small local mm-hmm. you know, credit unions and banks and put it all in you know, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citibank, and these things. Because those banks are all partnered with the Federal Reserve now on these uh, central bank digital currency pilot programs. So if they can bankrupt all the small banks, get everybody to yank their deposits, have these things collapse and move everything over to the big mega banks, it'll be a very simple process then to just switch over to the CBDC system. Uh, and that's what they're working on right now. And, you know, you mentioned something critical about the Great Depression. Very few people understand how this happened. Uh, but this was deliberate. Right? Uh, if you read your, your average government school history textbooks, they tell you, oh, you know, people just didn't know what was happening. It was just uh, the product of capitalism. Absolute baloney. This was engineered this way mm-hmm. by the mega bankers who own the Federal Reserve. And that's a provable fact. In fact, Ben Bernanke, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, admitted publicly. I've got the video where he says, yeah, we kind of really contributed to that whole Great Depression thing. And even explains the mechanics of how they did it. Uh, you know, first, they kept interest rates too low for too long in the so-called roaring 20s. So all, all these people who, you know, acting on the signals that they thought the market was sending, they went and they borrowed money at real low interest rates. They invested it in farms or businesses or buildings or whatever. And then the Federal Reserve said, ha just kidding. They raised interest rates very rapidly, sucked all this money out of the economy. Uh, and this was when we were still having the dollar at least nominally tied to gold, right? It was even harder to do it back then. That's exactly what they've done, right? Since the last economic crisis, they flooded the economy with funny money. Now they're sucking it out of the economy. And so what happens then, what happened in the Great Depression is people couldn't pay their loans. Um, businesses started collapsing. Homeowners couldn't pay their mortgage. Uh, businesses couldn't cover their loans. And so the bankers came in and they scooped up prime assets, companies, you know, stocks, farms, uh, anything you could think of for pennies on the dollar. And they ended up owning everything. The, the very people who own the Federal Reserve and who make the decisions at the Federal Reserve. So people don't realize the Federal Reserve is not a government agency. It's a bank owned by its member banks. They actually own shares in the regional banks and they actually appoint the directors. Uh, and so this is a scam. This is a criminal operation as far as I'm concerned. And your average American, your average person on this planet has no idea how this works. Well, it's clever because they used the word federal when they established it. So it sounds like it's the government, even though it's not. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it doesn't have reserves either, which is quite ironic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not federal. It doesn't have reserves. Um, it, it's it's truly remarkable that people could have bought into this. And um you know, it, it's really tragic how few people understand the name. It's actually not that complicated to understand. When you take out all the dumb terminology they use to try to confuse you, like quantitative easing, which just means, you know, stealing a bunch of your money by printing a bunch of new money. Uh, it's really not that complicated to understand. They're, they're just stealing your money. They're robbing you blind. They're creating currency out of nothing. In other words, they're robbing savers. Mm. And then they're loaning that currency into the economy at interest. They're never creating the interest that's necessary to pay back the principal that they create out of nothing. And so you're on this perpetual treadmill where there's never enough money to pay back the money that they created. And eventually they end up owning everything. The economy gets sucked into a black hole. They own everything. You own nothing, but you'll be happy as uh, Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum tell us. Well, the, the other thing is with all of this going on, you've couple that with the advancements in robotics and artificial intelligence and they're not going to need people soon. I mean, you won't, you don't, that, you know, you've got self checkouts in all the supermarkets. So you're getting rid of staff that way. You know, there's a, usually a couple of aisles of people on checkouts, which I always use and I don't use the self checkouts. I hate them. Um, but every which way they're looking to remove people from jobs. And then, you know, you won't need teachers or so many surgeons because they'll have robots doing it and all this stuff. I mean, in the end, people think, oh, this is great technology, but it's actually not good for humanity at all because it's doing people away from meaningful jobs. So what, they're going to sit in some little smart city playing computer games um, and getting a, a um, you know government handout, universal basic income kind of thing, and it's, it's not how people were designed to live. We were designed to work and have goals and, you know, have some freedom and they want to take all of that away. And and this whole artificial intelligence and the advance in robotics is pretty scary. 
It is. And, you know, I, I'm I, I'm not a Luddite. I'm, I'm fine with technology. Mm. But what we have to look at is who is using the technology and for what purpose. Right. And, and so when I say I'm not a Luddite, I, I don't mean that in, in a bad sense. Like I've never had a smartphone. I never will have a smartphone. You know, God willing, I've, I've had this little thing for a while. And um, so, you know, I mean, it's not that I'm opposed to technology It's that who has the technology and what are they using it for? It's just like a firearm. You know, a, a firearm can be used to defend an innocent child from marauders or a firearm can be used to, as we've seen lately, uh, shoot up a school by a, you know, a transgender activist who hates Christians. Uh, so, you know, the, it, it, depending on whose hand it, it's in and what it's being used for, it could be good or bad. It could be used for good purposes or evil purposes. If you go back far enough, you know, Cain and Abel, right? They slew his brother with a rock. Yeah. Uh, so, it, you know, what is it being used for? And if you look at who is developing artificial intelligence, who is behind this push, you've got absolutely wicked people. You've got uh, evil companies like Google. You've got the most murderous dictatorship in all of human history, the Communist Party of China, which incidentally ruthlessly persecutes the church. Uh, you've got people like Bill Gates of hell uh, and Microsoft. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, these are all really bad guys with a demonstrated track record of madness and wickedness. Uh, and so we need to be extremely concerned about this. Now, to the extent that technology is used to you know, ease the burden of labor, uh, I'm fine with that. Um, but to the extent that technology is used to enslave us, to wage war on truth, uh, that's very problematic. And, and very early on, when ChatGPT was just available in the beta version, I started trying this out to see what was going on here. And it took me all of 15 minutes to discover what was happening. This AI had been trained to view the world, if you could say that an AI system views the world, uh, through a godless, anti-Christian, progressive lens where the propaganda was built into it and it was actually programmed not to be able to make an argument counter to the propaganda. So I, you know, I, I talked to it, talked to it, you know, I communicated with this uh, program about climate change. And there was no possible way to get it to say something true about climate change that contradicted the narrative, even if it had been trained on that data, even if it knew what I was saying was true. So we have a very serious problem here where AI is going to be, you know, people don't realize how much data they have already given up. Every time you do a Google search, every time you surf the web, every time you walk around with your smartphone, you know, it's, tar it's tracking you, it knows who you're standing next to, it knows what you're buying on Amazon. Uh, and we didn't pay much attention to all this data that we were shedding. Well, as that data is centralized and fed into the artificial intelligence uh, systems that are being developed, it is going to unleash potentially the most comprehensive tyrannical system that could ever have been devised by man. Uh, even though I don't like Elon Musk necessarily, I like what he said about we're, we're kind of raising a demon here. Um, and I, I think that is true in more ways than one. Um, now, I, I don't believe that God is going to let this get to its logical conclusion. You know, a lot of these people think they're going to live forever without Christ, which mm -hmm. is preposterous. A lot of these people think they're going to evolve into gods. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that that uh, guy, Klaus, Yuval um, Harari, Noah Harari. Yeah. yeah, he actually said that he's going to become, they think they're going to become more powerful than the God of the Bible because he could only create organic life and we're going to be able to create inorganic organisms. So these people are uh, absolutely delusional. They've been handed over to a reprobate mind. I don't believe, just like with the Tower of Babel, you know, they have their plans. I, I believe God will stop them before this gets too far out of control. But um, clearly, we need to be paying attention to this. And when Bill Gates, I, I just did a big piece on, on this for uh, Freedom Project. It's at my Substack, uh, LibertySentinel.substack.com. Uh, Bill Gates is now saying artificial intelligence is going to replace teachers. Folks, you need to be paying attention here. Uh, when they talk about replacing teachers with AI, the agenda could not be more sinister, right? What's happened here is they've run up to the limit of what they can get human teachers to do, right? Uh, yeah, a lot of teachers were uncomfortable, for example, teaching little boys that they could castrate themselves to become their true selves, uh, you know, things like that. Um, and so they've reached the limit now of how far they can use these human teachers to indoctrinate and weaponize and, and program these children for future technocratic global slavery. So now they're ready to move on to the AI where they can program the computer systems to teach whatever they want. Uh, these computer systems aren't going to have a conscience that tells them that, hey, you shouldn't be teaching kindergartners that they might have been born in the wrong body. Um, and when you add that to the data gathering, gathering and data processing capabilities, they, I mean, they've been telling us for a decade, they're going to use these systems to predict the future interests, values, and behaviors of our children. Folks, they're creating a, a global technological prison more comprehensive than anything you could imagine in your worst nightmares. You need to be paying attention and you need to be on your knees in prayer because it is coming and it's coming faster than any of us can imagine. So that's a good pl um, place to start for our closing out. Uh, what do people do? You know, practically we can see this 
train coming, you know, down the tracks uh, towards us at breakneck speed, but what do we do? Well, I, I would say the very first thing we need to be doing is consulting the source of truth that God has given us, and that is his word. And we need to be in prayer and asking the Holy Spirit for guidance and for discernment and for wisdom. These are unprecedented times. Right? The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And in some respects, we've seen a lot of these um, crazy ideas. We've seen a lot of these crazy uh, you know, totalitarian schemes. But all of this together, it, it's just it's radically new, and I don't believe the church is prepared for it right now. Now we know the gates of hell will never prevail against the church, so I mean we don't need to be worried that you know AI and Bill Gates are going to wipe out the church. It's just not going to happen. But we, as God's people, we need to be in prayer, and we need to humbly implore God for his wisdom and for his discernment in these times, because this is unprecedented. Um, if you have a family that depends on you, if you have children that depend on you, you need to be paying extra care and extra attention to this. Um, you know, the, the Bible says whoever doesn't care for their own family, whoever doesn't take care of them is worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever. So, you know, are you handing your children over to a godless system that is going to use AI to totally reprogram their values and prepare them for satanic slavery? If you are, and if you say you're a Christian, you had better check yourself. You had better get in a conversation right now with your creator and ask him what he would have you do, I guarantee you it is not to hand your children over to this monstrous system that is being prepared right now. So we need to be in the word of God. We need to be in prayer. Um, we need to be in the world, but not of the world, right? Um, you know, and as the, and I, I say this a lot, but as the body of Christ, we all have different functions, right? Um, you know, you might be a teacher, you might be a prophet, you might be a, a you know, a, a journalist, you might be a uh, somebody who cares for others, you might be, you know, a stay-at-home mom. We all have a different role to play uh, as the body of Christ. And, you know, the, the eye can't say to the ear, like, hey, I'm more important than you, right? We all have our different role. And so what did God call you to do? What gifts did God give you to use during these times? Um, you know, if, if you're gifted in writing, maybe that's what you should be doing. If you're gifted in podcasting, like Tony, maybe that's what you should be doing. Uh, if you're gifted in preaching, well, maybe you need to be setting up a church and preaching the word of God and preaching the whole counsel of God. Uh, you know, are, are you a, a, a caring, nurturing person? Do you have medical skills? Well, maybe you can serve the poor in that way. So we all have different roles to play during these times, but the same instructions that Christ gave us 2,000 years ago are just as applicable today. Uh, when he told us to go out and make disciples of all the nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey all those things that he commanded us, you know, that was just as relevant to the disciples in the few years after Christ uh, you know, was resurrected and went to go be with his Father. That's just as applicable today. Right, what are you doing to disciple the nations? And if the answer is nothing, why not? And, and, you know, and it's going to look different for everybody. I'm not saying you need to quit your job and go move to Africa or, or, you know, California to become a missionary, right? Um, maybe that's not what God's called you to do, but maybe you have a good job right now. Maybe you could write a big check to your church so that they can support a missionary to go out and disciple the nations. And again, I, I, I don't know everybody's situation. I don't know what God has called you in particular to do, but if you'll be in the word of God, if you'll be in prayer, God will show you what you should be doing uh, in respect to your family, to your business, to your politics, your government, your ministry, whatever it is, uh, this is an exciting time to be alive, Tony. And, uh, you know, we all need to have a good understanding of what's coming and what we should be doing. That's great. Great summation. So where do people find you online? Uh, my personal website is at libertysentinel.org. Uh, we just recently uh, turned my weekly newsletter into a substack. So if people want to sign up for that, just go to libertysentinel.substack.com. It's free. Uh, just you know, sign up there. You'll get our weekly newsletter with the key stuff that you know what we think is most important happening for the week. Uh, I'm senior editor at the New American Magazine. If you want to read the articles we recently did on the 1607 first landing, thenewamerican.com. Uh, you can even get the print magazine. I don't know how much it costs to ship it to New Zealand, but you can also get the free daily headlines there. There. Um, the article I mentioned about the UN, that's available at the epictimes.com. I think it's behind a paywall, so you have to subscribe. Uh, and then, you know, if you need help getting children out of public schools, I'm a volunteer at Public School Exit. You can find us at publicschoolexit.com. I serve as uh, executive director. We're working to equip churches and parents to protect their children and remove them from the government school system. And that's kind of a, a quick overview, but the Substack will have kind of the, the most important stuff every week. And uh, I so appreciate what you're doing, Tony. I so appreciate you inviting me on your, your wonderful program. So thank you very much. And thank you again, because there was so much great food for thought in that interview. And um, yeah, I'm going to be listening back at, at some of it again myself, because there's a lot in there. So cheers, Alex. That was thank great. you, Tony. God bless you. Bless you too. 
And folks, don't forget our website, a minute to midnight.com. Subscribe to us there by going down the right hand side of the page and entering your email address if you haven't already done so. And a minute to midnight's run 100% by donations, and we really greatly appreciate the people that help us. And you can donate at a minute to midnight.com if you wish. And the music used, I've written, played, and recorded that's used in the shows. Well, God bless, stay safe, and hopefully we'll be back with another episode in a few days' time.